So, <laughs> when I was introduced, I said I play the piano and fly airplanes. Just be assured that I don't do those two things at the same time. Is the <laughs> getting an air, getting a piano and an airplane is a is a. So, uh, as I was listening to the music, when is this? Or am I cutting in and out? Yeah. As I was listening to the music on the way, and I couldn't help but notice that pretty much all of that music was from the late 60s. And one of the things that we as programmers don't pay enough attention to is stuff that happened a long time ago. Um, most of the things I'm going to be talking about today are things that came out of the lean movement. The lean movement that was started um, at Toyota in about 1970 or thereabouts. So this stuff is like 50 years old and it's well proven. Um, Toyota's been doing it for that long. A lot of other companies have been doing it for that long. But somehow, in the software industry, when I talk about things like this, people think of it as right, a revelation of some sort. That um, this is so new that it's scary. And we can't possibly do this because it's untrusted experimental stuff that we've been doing for 50 years. And of course, if we haven't been doing it for more than 50 years, we can't do it. And you see that in a lot of country, uh, companies, rather, is that they um, are basically working in the same way that companies worked in 1970. And those ways of working didn't work particularly well back then, and they don't work particularly well now. So I want to talk about Slack in particular, not the... Uh, there we go, lost my pencil. Not the program, but the word, Slack. Um, but I'm also going to talk a little bit about other lean concepts that feed into that. So let's get going. Oh, I should also say while well, here, I've, I have my email address and my Twitter handle. I'm also on Blue Sky with the same. Um, well, there we go. Should I just yell louder? Maybe I need a megaphone. But the, the, um, I, I put my email address and my Twitter handle up here on purpose. If you have any questions, just contact me. I'm happy, happy to do that. And I'm also going to be hanging around the conference, so if you have a question for me, you're welcome to just grab me and we can sit down and talk about things. So there are a couple of topics that I think are important topics here to start off with. Um, first one is that we're going to be working, at least initially, we'll be talking about working in complete systems. Now, usually programmers are not used to thinking in terms of systems. So a system of work really involves, for us, the entire company. And more than that. It starts with customers. And then it goes through all of the things that it has to go through in order to get a product out the door which involves way more than just the coding part, right? If you look at all of the stuff that's involved in getting a product at the door, the coding part is just that. And one of the difficulties there is that, um, well, Agile, which I think of as Agile with a little trademark on top of it nowadays, because nobody's actually doing Agile anymore. Right? People say, I hate Agile, and I hate what they're doing too, but it's not Agile. It's put, the, put the blame where the blame is, is, should be. But usually we have Agile or Scrum or something like that in this, little, in this little piece. They say, we're doing Scrum, yay, we're Agile. And I'm saying, no, 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 no not, not until you do this whole thing. Right? It's not just a little piece that involves coding. So when you think about what a system is, a system is a um, whole comprised of parts. Now, the thing about those parts is that all of the parts have to be working for the whole to work. But if you look at a car as a system, the point of which is to transport you from home to work, for example. If any of the parts of that car, at least most of the parts of that car, if they, any of them fail, you're not going to get to work. If the engine fails, if the fuel pump fails, if maybe if the radio fails, if you really have to listen to something as you're commuting. But the point here is that um, 
every piece has to be functioning. And every piece interacts with all the other pieces in very complex ways. I'm using the word complex in this sense, right? Is that there's complicated, right? A, a watch is complicated, lots of moving parts, but you can look at it and figure out how it works. A complex system you cannot look at and figure out how it works. And most of the systems that we work with, including the programming systems, are, are uh, complex systems. They're not complicated. Well, they're complicated too sometimes. But they don't have to be. In fact, it turns out that the most effective complex systems are the simplest ones. Because as soon as it starts getting more complicated, things start slowing down a lot. And we don't want that to happen. So the other part of, of a system that often people don't think about is let's say we wanted to build the best car ever. So we looked around and we found out that the best engine for a car is made for Rolls Royce. So we buy one of those and we put it at a warehouse. And then we look around some more and we say, oh, the best transmission is made by Porsche, so we'll grab that and put it in a warehouse. And then we look around even more and we say, oh, the best suspension is made by, I don't know, whoever makes the best suspension. And we got, grab one of those and puts the, put them together in a warehouse. Once we've accumulated all of the parts of the car, do we have a car? Right? No. And not only do we not have a car, we can't build a car from those parts because they're not designed to fit together. So the system as a whole is what matters, not the individual pieces. Now, you see people making that mistake of thinking that it's the individuals all the time. Right? There's the myth of the so-called 10x programmer, right? the person who's vastly better than everybody else, do 10 times more work. But one 10x programmer, I'll talk more about them in a moment, but one 10x programmer it doesn't actually speed up the system. Because if you do 10 times more work than anybody else, all that means is the next person downstream from you has got more work than they can handle. So the system as a whole does not get faster. And the 10x programmer, there's a lot of dysfunction associated with that too. Um, they become bottlenecks inside the software development uh, system because people keep deferring to them. Right? Often the 10x programmer is the only person that has in their head an understanding of how the system as a whole works. And um, <clears throat> Clearly, the, that's not good, right? If that person has to go on vacation or something, all work stops. So having these 10x programmers is not a good idea because you're thinking in terms of individual productivity, whatever that is, as compared to the productivity of the overall system, and it's the system that matters. The other thing about 10x programmers that is equally important, or at least an aspect of that, which I'm seeing a lot now, there's a lot of discussion that happens about working remotely. If you bring up work from home, there's always discussion. And one of the things that people say to justify working from home um, most of the time is they say, I have never been more productive than I, since I, I, than I am now, right? <laughs> having work, work, started working at home. The working at home has made me more productive. Well, frankly, I don't care whether you're more, more productive or not. What I care is whether the system is more productive. And one person working really, really well is not going to speed up the system. The only way to speed up the system is to um, have everybody working better. And the way you accomplish that is with things like constant communication. And if you don't have constant communication, everything slows down. So remote has a cost that people don't want to acknowledge. Now, I'm not saying we shouldn't be working remotely, right? There's, there's always a cost-benefit trade-off, and if, if the benefits are better or outweigh the cost, then great, do it. But um, you have to imagine, though, that there is a cost, right? There's always a cost. So the, the point that I'm trying to make here is that um, when it comes to putting the software together, the speed of the entire system is important. And... The other thing that's important is a smooth flow through that entire system, which is to say, you don't really want anybody um, stopping work from happening. Let's put it that way. Ah. Those are my notes, but I don't need them. The, the, um, so we want a smooth development flow through the entire system. Now, if you think about how that plays out, usually, um, imagine that we have a, um, several people working when there are dependencies. So 
you work along at a certain rate doing what you want to do. And suddenly you bang up against something that requires somebody else. Let's say that your database administration has been handed off to somebody else. At that point, your work stops. And you're sitting here basically idle, waiting for the database person to do whatever they do. So meanwhile, we have, oops, what happened to all my colors? There we go. Meanwhile, we have the database person who was a my while or was uh, idling, and now they're working. Now, notice that there is a gap here in addition to the... So the, it, I'm not talking about context swaps. I'm just saying it takes a little bit of time for the database person to get to you because they're working on other things. So this is called a bottleneck, right? If, you, if, if the person that you need to do the work is not available then nothing is good that's happening. Now, bear in mind that what we're trying to do is to get software into our customers' hands sooner. Not faster, but sooner. There's a difference between those two things. Right? So, for example, we could work really fast on a giant monolith and only deliver once a year. And in that case, we might be working fast, but we're certainly not getting stuff into our customers' hands sooner. Ideally, you want to get new things into the customer's hands every week or two, which people used to have fits about, but uh, we've all gotten used to it, is that every time you go onto a website, it's a little, little different. Um, your, uh, you, the apps on your phone are upgrading once a week sometimes. So that's getting stuff into the customer's hands sooner. So working faster isn't necessarily important. But going back to this example, the database person works away, and they get finished. And what that now that they're finished. Now again, it's, when they get finished here, we can't just take up what we were doing before because during this idle time, we were probably working on something else. So we have to get to the point where we can wrap that up and then we can start working on the initial problem again. And this keeps going back and forth every time we have a dependency. Now the point is, is that what matters is this time. Right? That's the time at which we can get it into our customers' hands. And all of these flat places where we're idling is taking away from that time. Right? If we, this graph is actually, I'm just doing it ad hoc here, but it's not bad. Um, it's basically saying we're spending a little bit half, of, more than half of our time waiting, which means we've doubled the amount of time it's taken to get the software into our customers' hands. So there are obvious solutions to that, one of which is that we eliminate all dependencies. If I, don't, if I can just work on the database myself, I don't have to worry about connecting with somebody else. Um, and you can do that on small systems. Right, is the, there's this whole agile notion of the whole team. So that the team should have uh, represented on it every skill that you need to get the code out the door and into the customer's hands. And I've worked with a lot of startups and that's eminently possible with startups. So we do it all the time. But the bigger the corporation is, the bigger the company is, the less likely you'll be able to get rid of dependencies entirely, which means that you're back with this, this stuff going on. So... That's a problem. Everything that we do that adds dependencies is a problem. And all of the wait times associated with dependencies are a problem. But one of the things that we can try, on, try and work on are these areas where everybody's idle. Right? So we can't eliminate dependencies entirely, but we can at least attempt to have some kind of handle on... Um, how to, how to deal with those dependencies, how to make things, I don't know, run smooth, more smoothly. Now, the other factor here has to do with how that work, what, of the nature of the work, as it piles up and gets released and stuff, is a lot of people say, well, I'm late this week, but I'll make it up next week. So let's, let's look at that for a moment. This is a, app, a little JavaScript application that I wrote years ago now. 
So the idea here is that we're trying to deal with, with work. With work. Um, I'm setting up the variability here to be, well actually let's make the variability low to start off with. So what that means is I am attempting to do four things per increment. Is that my quote capacity is I can handle four stories a week. So the idea then is can we work on four stories a week? And the answer is usually no. We want to. In an ideal world, if there are dependencies and everybody's working on four stories a week, you'll finish your four stories and hand it off to the next person who will finish those four stories and you'll have this smooth flow through the whole system. But it never works that way. As things take longer than we expect, things take less time than we expect, um, unforeseen things happen. Some insane boss comes and says, you've got to drop everything you're doing and working on this pet thing that occurred to me last night at midnight. And the, I've had that happen too many times. I imagine most of us have. But the point is, is that you can't very well say, no, I'm not going to work on that. That's nuts. Stupidest idea I've ever seen, and in any way it won't help us get the software into the customer's hands faster. So most of us are not in a position where we can say that, and we have to be. But the point is, is there's always a little bit of variation. So I built the variation into this little random number spinner up here. So let me spin it once. So what that says is that I spun a five, which means that I got five things, I could get five things done in the next iteration. And I've got all five of them. Now there's a little green dot on the bottom. It said plus one. It's kind of hard to read. It said plus one. But what that green dot says is I expected to do four things, and in fact I did five, so I'm up one from where I want to be, which is that, that uh, dashed line. Right, that dashed line is where we have smooth flow and we're flowing perfectly across the system without any variation. Now, do another roll for the next step. This is a plus one, and that's actually going to work because we had five things to work on, and the next stage can accept five things. Another, this is not going to give me my example because everything is working perfectly. But the, this is the problem with random. Oh, there's a minus one finally. Okay, so notice what happened here. Is there were initially five things here. But because of variation, the downstream activity could only handle three of them. So it accepted three things to do, and there's two of them still sitting in the previous steps can, with nobody working on them. And that stuff is waste, to use another team term out of Toyota and the lean world. Um, Muda is a very specific term in that world. Is it, people complain about it because they define waste in a very broad sense, right? They say, well, a meeting is waste. Well, that one I don't think any of us would disagree with. But, the, there are certain things, certain times where you have necessary waste, um, but not often, not often. So let's do one more spin. And that time was another minus one, but we had the minus one before, so we're okay. We move them all over to the third, the final thing. But we're still down one. So we should, the whole system should have put out four units of work in. The whole system has only put out three. All right, now I'm going to just automate it and let it run. And the results of this are kind of terrifying. Now notice there's, there's not variation, much variation here. It's just plus or minus one. But notice that as we get to the right, we don't catch up. And that's because we always have this problem of I'm working on fewer things than I expected to, and that just propagates down the system. And even with the variation of one, right, we're already down, how many, how many cycles have we done yet? I don't remember. There we go. Right? Is, that red never turns green on the far right. And on the left, where there are no dependencies in front of us, we're ahead of schedule. 
As soon as you introduce one dependency, we went behind, but now we're catching up. As soon as you introduce two dependencies, notice that the best we can get is, is, is what we expected, but we're going down as the more dependencies there are. Right now, plus or minus one is easy. Let us do this same thing here. Here, let me reset it. Um, do the same thing here. But I'm going to set the, the variability now is high, plus or minus three. And I'll just let that go. I would have. Oh, come on. <laughs> there we go. And the thing to notice here is that as stuff builds up, this gets really scary really fast. Right, is that look how far further down those red dots are than they were when we have high variability. And the further we get to the, <laughs> the right, the worse it gets. And we never make up next week what we couldn't do this week because there's always more work coming in. That picture on the right is particularly horrifying, the one on the far right. It's always like this. This is just math. Right, so wishful thinking should not trump math, though more often than not it does. But among other things, this means once you get behind, you will never catch up, ever. You can only get more and more behind. And that's something that needs to be built into the way our business is planned, and it's not. But we want to get a handle on this variation problem. Right, is that this situation is just untenable. So how do you do that, right? How do you get a handle on how the variation is fixed? And there are, there are a couple ways to do it. One of which is the point of the talk is Slack. So let's, uh, let's see if we have time. Let's see here. Let's see if we have time to talk about some of the other ones. Um, the, the main problem here or a couple of main problems here. Go back to the nodes. The, often you will see a diagram like this where at any given moment um, it will look, as we saw with the, with the, with the brown, oops, going. But often there's like, three or four things going on, right? So while this team is working on something in a bottleneck, actually, let's do it this way. Um, do, 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 the, do this the easy way. So here we have a team. They're doing what they're doing, and then they have to stop because they've handed it off to test. So they're waiting for test to come back, and test comes and starts doing its its work, and then it throws that back up to engineering, it says you have to make changes, so it makes the changes. And then that gets thrown back to test, which gets to it eventually, does the work, and then handles it back to engineering, which has been busy doing other things. Right? Now, meanwhile, in engineering, while they, were, while they were waiting, they probably brought in another thing. Oops. They brought in another thing to do. So, um, so that other thing now is engineering, is engineering is doing that other thing. And they do that for a while, and then they hit some dependency, and they stop doing that, too. And then maybe that wasn't enough to fill in their days, so they started working on a third thing. The point I'm trying to make here is that all of this time where nothing is happening gets amplified with the number of things you're working on. Right? This is something that's in Lean is called Little's Law. And what Little's Law says, basically, is that uh, the speed that you were working at is uh, basically the inversely proportional to the number of things you're working on. If you're working on only one thing, you'll move very quickly. If you're working on two things, you will, you will actually be three times slower because of all of the waiting and overhead associated with the context swap. 
right? If you work on three things at a time, you'll probably be close to nine or ten times slower. It's not a, it's not a, it's not a linear curve. It's a, it's a, 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 I don't know if it's logarithmic, but at least it's an upsloping curve. So step one, then, is to try and minimize work in progress. Minimize work in progress, WIP is what it's called. So that's the first easy thing we can do. Um, if I come in as a consultant, I'm, I'm often brought in nowadays as a process consultant. And when I sit down and talk to whoever hired me, they said the problem is that we are not getting stuff out the door faster. And that's an insanely easy problem to solve. Is that if you want to get stuff out the door faster, work on fewer things at a time. Just work on one thing at a time. And the, the whole project mentality inside of companies where we have to work on individual projects and then somehow all of those projects will be glommed together to make a product. What that is doing is increasing the number of things you're working on at a, at a given time. And Little's Law tells us that that's going to make us go slower. So we don't want to be working on projects. We want to be working on a uniform product. All of the teams are working on the product. They're not working on projects. And all of the things associated with projects, right, time and budget, all of that kind of stuff. Uh, we don't have to think about that if we're thinking about the product as a whole. When something needs doing, a team does it. Which means the planning has to be completely different, but it will speed us up. Right, if you can bring work in progress down to one, you will be working much, much faster than you are now. And if you don't want to do anything else, do that. All right, now the second issue, which is important, is the one that I... Um, wanted to actually talk about, which is related to this, and that's the idea of slack time. Now, the problem with slack time that we saw in the earlier picture is that as you are working on something else, stuff is piling up for you to work on, right? The so-called backlog in Sprint, or in Scrum, rather. And the, the backlogs are bad things because when work is sitting on the backlog, that represents a liability from a financial point of view. Right? So things that you have spent money on that are not put into the customer's hands are a negative on your balance sheet. Because it's a unit of money that you've spent for which there is no corresponding profit. So... The more that builds up, the worse, the worse off we are. So we want to make sure that things don't build up. One of the ways to do that is to say, okay, I'm going to free up time, enough time in my schedule so that if something unexpected comes along, I can just work on it now. And that's slack time. Right? It's, a, it's time that you are deliberately putting onto your schedule in order to eliminate this buildup of things to do. Now, notice that having slack time in the system does not in any way impact the overall speed at which the overall system is working. Right? All that it's doing is it's saying, okay, this one piece of the system can work a little bit more effectively because it's only working on one thing at a time, and there aren't a bunch of tasks piled up to the left of it. But the system as a whole isn't going to help, right? If it's only one team doing this, then all they're going to be doing is producing stuff that's piling up downstream. And it's got to be happening with the whole system. So you have to have slack in the whole system in order to speed the system up by getting rid of the sorts of dependencies and weights that we were looking at a moment ago. Right? So there are a lot of examples of things that do this right. Think about fire departments. Right? If, you, if your house catches on fire and you call up the emergency line, you really, really, really don't want the person who answers that phone call to say, I'm so sorry your house is on fire, but we're busy right now and we'll put it on the backlog. And when we get around to it, we'll send you an email telling you when the fire truck is coming. Right? Nobody's going to be happy with that. So fire departments spend, have a lot of slack time in their system. I, I was chatting with the, the fire station down the street is that I, I have one a couple blocks away from me, and I was chatting with one of the fire people. And I said, I asked him, 
You know, how much slack time do you have? What percentage of your time do you actually spend putting out fires? And he said, oh, 2%. Right? And the rest of the time is there so that if your house catches on fire, somebody is available. It's making sense to everyone. So what do they do in the other time? Right? If you're going to free up slack time in your own schedule, what do you do with the slack time instead of, quote, working? Well, first of all, that notion of quote, working is really a bad notion, is that this idea of busyness, we should be busy all the time, and that we equate busyness with productivity, that's nonsense. I can be very busy doing stuff that are, is of no use to anybody, and that is not proving my overall productivity. But we don't want busyness, so you don't have to fill in that slack time with anything. If you spent that slack time playing poker with your other teammates, it would not in any way impact the overall system performance, provided that you can put down the cards and work on something when the something comes in. So, you could do nothing. And that makes a lot of sense, is that it is, it's considered counterintuitive by many people, but there are a couple, a couple of companies now that have very publicly published the results of going to four-day work weeks. And where the, literally it was a four-day work week because people weren't expected to work late or come in or anything like that. And what they found is that they were doing exactly the same amount of work in four days that they used to do in five. Because that extra fifth day is a bit of slack time built into the schedule. In this case, it's 20% slack time. Right, Don Reinertsen wrote a really good book called The Principles of Product Development of Flow. The author is Reinertsen. I can never remember whether it's E-I or I-E. Let's pretend it's E-I. Um, I should say, by the way, this is not a book you want to approach if you're not good at math. This is really, it's a math book. It's about the underlying mathematics behind productivity. And what Don figured out is for most companies with the amount of, amount of variation that you see in most companies, you need 30% slack time. And the, the, that's, you need more if there's a lot of variability. We all saw that red, that horrific red set of red dots. If, you, if there's not much variation, you might be able to get by with a little less. But you always need something. So filling it with nothing is fine, but you don't have to fill it with nothing. I know a lot of companies where their slack time is spent um, working on individual projects, for example, or it's spent learning something and presenting classes to your teammates or other people in the company so they can learn what you just learned. Right? There's, there's lots of things that you can do during your slack time that you can put down easily, that you can just stop doing if you need to. So all of that will make you move faster. Right, our goal here then is to speed up the system. And you speed up the system by eliminating all those piles of work sitting in front of you. And, you, and you, you speed up the system by eliminating the bottlenecks. And in both of those cases, the problem is I'm busy doing something right now, so I can't work on that thing you ju that, I, that just came into my backlog. So the other way to put this, if you're in, a, if you are, are in an agile mindset, is the best size of a backlog. People often ask me, what, how big should my backlog be? And that's easy, just don't have a backlog. Best side of a backlog is zero. Because what that means is you have enough slack time in the system that no matter what you have in the way of variation, you can always just do it right now. There's nothing on the backlog. So you don't need, backlogs are not an agile thing. Backlogs are a scrum thing. And scrum, to my mind, is kind of an abomination. I, I, there's, no, there's no agility there. So don't think that backlogs are part of being agile, whatever that means anymore. But it's, um, because it's not, right? Ideally, you want no backlog at all. All right? So, put Slack into your system. That's the, that's the main takeaway here. And you want a significant amount of it. And of course, that 30% rule, that's not, that's not cast in stone. It's not carved in stone, right? If, if, you, if, you, if you need more, add it. If you have too much, you can reduce it a little bit, just... 
you know, take it on the fly, is actually observe how you're working and then adjust these numbers in order to uh, compensate, or uh, compensate's not the right word, but in order to um, um, <clears throat> accommodate, that's a better word, the differences in the speeds of various teams and that sort of thing. So don't think this is a hardcore war, but 30% is not a good place, is not a bad place to start. Um, 20% is easy, right? The four-day work week comes to mind immediately. Okay. So that is what I have to say. Are there any questions? I'll put a big question mark up here. Any questions? 